<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marion Bittler, and I'm a professor of economics and the interim director of the Institute for Social Sciences here at UC Davis. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our lecture this afternoon, Cognitive Science and the Social, to be delivered by Dr. Stephen P. Turner. First, I want to thank you for joining us today. And I would also like to thank our co-sponsors, the Center for Mind, Brain, and Mind and Brain, the Department of Philosophy, and the Department of Sociology. Finally, thanks to everyone who helped make this come about, including um, Vicki Austin, uh, Assistant Director at ISS, and John Hall, Research Professor of Sociology at UC Davis and UC Santa Cruz. Indeed, Dr. Hall will shortly be introducing Dr. Turner, and before I invite him to the podium, I'll say a few introductory words of my own. John Hall is the author and editor of many books, including the Handbook of Cultural Sociology, Apocalypse from Antiquity to the Empire of Modernity, and Cultures of Inquiry from Epistemology to Discourse and Socio-Historical Research. Over the course of his career at UC Davis, he's held many positions, including director of the UC Davis Center for History, Society, and Culture, and director of graduate studies in the UC Davis Department of Sociology. Please join me in welcoming him. Well, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here and to see the Institute for Social Sciences thriving. And uh, I certainly want to thank uh, the Institute and Marianne and Vicki uh, for uh, organizing this lecture and the other people who sponsored it. I think it's especially uh, really a wonderful opportunity to engage the social sciences with the biological sciences. Uh, and that's something that uh, an interdisciplinary conversation that uh, is um, uh, certainly welcome uh, everywhere in the world and that UC Davis I think is pretty well positioned uh, to encourage. And uh, interestingly I think uh, perhaps the social science side of uh, mind, self, and society if we can use an old term from the University of Chicago is um, uh, perhaps the least developed in looking at mind, brain, and the social. And Stephen Turner, our speaker today, is the person to address it. He is the distinguished uh, university professor in the philosophy department at the University of South Florida. Uh, he finished his PhD at the University of Missouri uh, just before I got there, and I didn't meet him until a few years after that. He's published prolifically and incisively on a welter of topics in sociological theory, the history and philosophy of social science, and cognitive science. Uh, among his many other interests are explaining normativity, especially the conflict between philosophical and social scientific accounts of normativity, and issues related to the implications of cognitive neuroscience for social theory. Uh, especially related to the problem of tacit knowledge, uh, which is the title of one of his books, Understanding uh, the Tacit. It would be impossible to adequately characterize the depth and sophistication of Stephen Turner's scholarship without unduly prolonging this introduction. For my part, just let me say that I regard him as the dean of American social theory. Professor Turner has agreed to a period of questions and discussion following his presentation, Cognitive Science and the Social. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Turner. I promise you I'm not as scary as all that. So let me get this back on. OK, so what I'm going to say for some of you is going to be really elementary. I'm going to cover a lot of. Uh, of territory and just try to put together things. And this is uh, sort of relates to the fact that I have a brand new book with, which also tries to simplify and uh, uh, describe some of the issues that come up when trying to somehow relate cognitive science to um, the, the domain of uh, the social. Um, now what's going on here? Okay, um, let me start out with a social kind of problem, really historical problem in uh, social science, which is that social science is sort of divided between interpretive and uh, non-interpretive, objectivity-oriented wings. And 
Um, this has, uh, runs through essentially every discipline in the, the social sciences. And the basic idea has been that um, things that you can count are objective, and we need, in order to make the social sciences scientific, we need to concentrate on those things that we can um, count. And this famous incident in the history of social science where uh, William Fielding Ogburn was given the, the responsibility of providing a motto for the social science building, and he quoted uh, Kelvin saying something along the lines, he misquoted him, saying something along the lines of, if you can't measure, you can go home, give it up. <laughs> and the uh, uh, faculty were outraged about this and threatened to, uh, um, in, the, in the Chicago parlance at the time, take him for a ride, meaning take him out and, like a gangster and have him shot for saying this. So that was, it was a strong uh, issue um, at the time and uh, ever since. So the alternative was a kind of interpretivism, and the issue with that was it wasn't really objective. And the solution to that was that any interpretation could be substantiated in some sense. And the idea was that, well, we need to turn this into a technique as well. So we called, they borrowed the name of hermeneutics from biblical uh, hermeneutics. and. Uh, invented a lot of methodological ideas about how you made interpretation more objective. So that's the way things were um, what's that? until pretty recently. So then you get this shocking discovery of uh, mirror neurons and the, the story which uh, I'm repeating like 99th hand, God knows what the truth is, uh, is one of these great discovery stories. So they've got a monkey strapped in, and they're checking uh, to see what uh, neurons fire off when he does uh, certain motor uh, activities, moving his arm and so on and so forth. And it's a hot day, and the uh, uh, research assistant who's doing this uh, goes out for a gelato and comes back. And he starts eating the gelato. He looks up at the screen and he sees that the monkey is firing off the same thing. And what this shows is, was that the motor neurons were being fired at the same time as the perceptual neurons. There had to be something connecting the two, and that's what they discovered as uh, uh, mirror neurons. Okay. Then there was previously, whoops, lost that, uh, some fascinating research by psychologists, by Meltzoff and Moore. I think that's Meltzoff in the, the picture there. And uh, uh, you can see the hairstyles. It was the 70s. And uh, he started uh, these experiments with neonates, babies that were right out of the womb, and sure enough, he made faces at them, and they made the faces back. Now, not all babies did this, but some babies did this, and uh, um, there's a naturally an enormous amount of controversy about what this means, but uh, it certainly shows that there's something very uh, social, since this is absolutely a social uh, activity, that happens immediately, and there's some kind of uh, capacities for uh, social interaction that start right at the beginning. So a lot of thinking about uh, of child development sort of uh, um, accepts that interaction with the mother and all of this sort of stuff is uh, uh, essential to um, development, but the models tend to focus on the internal uh, cognitive development of the of the babies, and this sort of throws a wrench into that because it um, uh, lo looks like a lot more cognitive development than should be there for a neonate. Okay, so uh, now if you look at um, just those two uh, processes, they look like we've got uh, something that really throws a monkey wrench into this whole 
objectivity versus interpretation story because now we have a story about something objectively really there as a neural process where something pretty sophisticated happens. A subject is targeted, their actions are understood in some sense, and um, uh, we know something about how this actually happens in the brain. So the process is objective, and it's, uh, the product of the process is as objective as any other observational activity. Um, and no matter what you think of this, it seems to be a component of uh, understanding. And since understanding is what we do to one another and social interaction, um, that makes it pretty um, important. Okay. So, however, uh, there are some pretty big limitations to uh, understanding um, in general. Um, what we understand about other people and what we understand about ourselves goes together pretty closely. When children learn mentalistic terms, they learn it for others and themselves at the same time. Uh, and when we think about what we can understand by our, about ourselves by introspection or reflection or whatever, um, and we think about what we can't understand about ourselves, there's a big area that we can't understand about ourselves. So we can't understand how uh, things go from our uh, irises to our brains and make images. We can't introspect that. But those are all processes that are pretty important. And the other feature of this that makes things really complicated uh, or problematic for a general analysis is that mental terminology varies culturally. Uh, and we can sort of pretend that it doesn't and say that, well, there's a, a sort of standard conception of action that corresponds to a theory of mind and so forth. Uh, but it does run into problems when you try to apply those uh, uh, notions to uh, other cultures. Um, okay, so later on I'll talk about this as the Verstehen bubble. Verstehen's just understanding, uh, and uh, the bubble, by the bubble I mean the limitations, the limitations that we have in even thinking about uh, the mental world, but that we use in order to interact with other people and so forth, and also that we use in social science to understand um, stuff that goes on in the social world. So I'm not going to give you a fancy argument for that, but I think if you think about it a little bit, uh, even if you look at something like um, a causal model in economics or uh, in other social sciences, when you start breaking down the links that form the arrows in that uh, causal model and those directed arrow graphs that make up causal models, um, they're not links that, are, that represent laws of science. They're links that represent something that we understand, usually uh, a kinds of actions that somebody might take that link one input to uh, another output. So when you get to the very bottom of social science explanations, you usually find something that's uh, fundamentally uh, mentalistic. So it really belongs in this... Uh, for stay in uh, bubble. Okay, so that's social science, and their, that's their world. Uh, with cognitive science, um, I'm going to try to give you a very brief overview that relates to this, but uh, the uh, main distinction I want to make is between something I'll call the standard approach, and which is uh, uh, as Herbert Simon famously put it, the, the brain is a computer made of meat. And uh, an, a series of oppositional approaches, usually called the 4E approaches, which emphasize the embodied character of action and of uh, cognition. So it's not just the brain, it's the body as well. And uh, enactivism, which um, emphasizes the idea that what the brain is there to do is to act 
rather than to process information. Um, and uh, uh, the ecological, which emphasizes the relationship between the organism and the environment and how it is that those are sort of uh, help constitute what cognition uh, is. And then extended uh, mind, which is pretty uh, especially relevant to what uh, um, I'm going to talk about, which is the idea that we dump a lot of our cognitive uh, problems off on other things. So if I wanted to uh, um, get to a different place in Davis and I'm given an address, there are a whole lot of ways for me to figure out how to get there. And they would include looking at a map, and the map has got something in there already. So I'm, uh, uh, rather than uh, some other strategy, I'm using that in order to get there. But I could also ask somebody directions, or I could punch it in on my uh, Garmin or my Waze and follow the, the instructions that are read out to me. So in all of these cases, I'm saving cognitive labor by uh, substituting something that then we can think of, well, that's really a part of mind as well. Um, and, okay, so um, all of those things, all of those E's are alternatives to the standard model, and they all work more or less by um, dumping off cognitive work. And the core problem that they are trying to address is issues having to do with computational speed. So I'll get back to that. But so one another concept is computational load. How much work has to be done in order to uh, perform some task? Now, if you're in cognitive science, you probably have seen this this uh, hexagon a million times, um, and it's supposed to represent the different the relations between areas of uh, uh, cognitive science. And so one of the, and if you look at enough of these, you're going to see uh, sometimes it's just anthropology <laughs> instead of social science. So social science is really the uh, um, uh, neglected child in this um, hexagon. Um, there are pretty intense relationships between the other parts, but the social stuff tends to drop out, partly because um, the, the concern has been to identify universal features of uh, cognition. Social science is more concerned with variation. Anthropology sort of gets in because it fits with the kind of evolutionary uh, uh, approach to um, uh, cognition and uh, therefore talks about uh, what things that ought to be universal. Um, so. Uh, Social sciences is, is the, uh, you know, as I say, neglected uh, child orphan in this uh, uh, picture. Um, but an odd thing about the uh, 4E approaches is that they in, entirely without attempting to, and not because they came out of a desire to engage the social, they all involve things that involve social variation. So they open the door in a way that the classical model really doesn't do to the uh, uh, social. Okay, so we can talk about this hexagon and we can talk about the problem that creates. So there are all these specialized areas in cognitive science. How do they all hang together? And the uh, uh, problem is that they don't really hang together very well. So there are lots of ways of thinking about what the relationships between these things are. A lot of them are uh, designed or attempt to sort of say, okay, we can re reduce more or less all of these problems to some particular uh, aspect of cognitive science and then solve the rest of it by uh, looking at that. So you've got people who say that, look, you know, computational psychology is really the core of cognitive science. Uh, once you understand that, you, you're going to understand the rest of it. Uh, and it's all going to um, fit together. There's a guy named uh, Herbert Gintis who's written uh, um, a, an attempt to do all this integration. And he says, well, you know, the, co the common thing in all of cognition is the fact that 
uh, even the smallest organism is in a game theoretical situation. So if we just take game theory and the cognition involved in that and those kinds of decisions as the core, we can work our way up to what societies themselves actually look like because they're game theoretic problems too. Um, so I'm going to look at some examples of that. Um, but the other strategy that's especially popular in philosophy is uh, the idea that, well, they're just different levels of analysis. So we can do a kind of functional analysis. I'll give some examples of that. And then we can say that's going to be connected to some lower level like actual uh, uh, brain physiology, um, but only loosely connected. And uh, maybe in the distant future we'll figure out exactly what these connections are, but for now we can, we can uh, not worry about it too much and uh, uh, just try to be uh, more or less cognizant of uh, the difficulties in relating levels to one another. Okay. Um, Okay, so what happens in uh, most of these uh, analyses, and that you can go on the web and find <laughs> dozens of examples of this, is that uh, the social really does get uh, left out in most of these pictures. Um, it th just doesn't seem uh, very central. And that uh, leads, it, uh, leads to a very particular view of the social. So here's a, you know, a, a nice, uh, very typical one. You can see the arrows go to psychology and include things like social psychology and social cognition as the connection between the sociocultural world and, and psychology, which is considered to be general. Then everything else is indirectly connected only through uh, the level of the psychological. Um, so the idea then become, is that, well, we get these fully developed, we explain these fully developed psychological beings they are the ones whose relationships we use to explain uh, the sociocultural level. Um, and, uh, okay. Um, so, there isn't a very good solution to this. Fitting all these pieces together uh, uh, doesn't work terribly well. And uh, especially, uh, they don't ver work very well with social diversity or culture. And there's some f very interesting findings that just don't fit this paradigm at all. So there's an um, economist who's done this uh, incredibly interesting study where he looks at uh, languages and the type of future tense verbs that they have. And he finds that uh, the kind that we're used to uh, has a very strong correlation with certain kinds of future-oriented behavior and especially economic behavior, things like savings. And the differences are enormous. So you're talking about 30% differences uh, between cultures or speakers of languages which use a different verb tense than the ones we do now. That's something that doesn't fit any of these models, uh, but it's something that's got to run through the brain somehow or other. It's got to connect up the linguistic to something that r relates to uh, social differentiation or social diversity or different uh, practices in the world. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, you know, that I don't have a solution to that one, but somebody needs to figure that one out. Okay. and. In general, we've got a problem with what the brain itself uh, uh, actually does and looks like. So there's a psychologist named Epstein who uh, has uh, written an inflammatory note to, uh, uh, that got a lot of uh, fairly hysterical response, which uh, says that, hey, um, the brain doesn't contain all of these things. All of these things that we talk about as being a part of cognitive processes uh, just aren't there. Uh, we, we, these are all uh, computer notions that aren't actually uh, physically represented in the brain. So the response to that was uh, um, um, extensive, immediate, and vicious. 
and uh, uh, it said something like this, and this gives you an idea of what actually the mainstream alternative looks like. Um, so Epstein hasn't thought about how you uh, catch a fly ball, and um, what you need to catch a fly ball is to integrate all kinds of things, and you need a lot of computation and uh, a lot of uh, algorithms in order to get you over to uh, the fly ball, keep them from falling over, and so on and so forth. And the punchline is, I'd like to see Epstein design a walking robot, little, long, a running robot, without any algorithms at all. So then it's pretty clear that the model is something like AI, that uh, w when we think about the brain, we need to think about it as having a design like uh, a robot, and it's got to contain all the computational stuff that's necessary to make a robot uh, do something. So, yeah, this is an assumption, and it's uh, part of uh, the sort of the, what I'm calling the standard view. The other part is what uh, uh, some kind of times called encodingism. Uh, it's the idea that in it, the brain has to do some kind of um, logic-like information processing, and the, uh, because it's logic-like, it's got to be logic-like in the familiar ways of logic. So logic works with well-formed formula and rules. And so the idea is that if we think we're, we're thinking by combining things. We have to have things in the form that can be combined. We have to have rules that combine them. And the brain needs to be generating these things. So things like uh, um, sentences and so forth uh, seem to be the kinds of things that have to have uh, this kind of coding structure. Um, so, but these are these have-to arguments. You assume that the brain thinks in this particular way and those are sort of vulnerable ar arguments. You're not really finding that. You can find experiments that uh, seem to conform uh, to that. Um, but to get to the level of saying that's really how the brain works is uh, still a stretch. So these arguments uh, are all over the place. And they basically work uh, like this, um, that um, in order to do something, uh, um, it, it, the kinds of things that a computer does, the brain has to do the kinds of computations a computer does, and uh, the, um, the way to understand the brain is to understand the algorithms that enable the brain to do this stuff. So you can see with all of this, so even some simple thing like catching a fly ball, it's going to be enormously complicated and enormously difficult computationally to simulate. And you, so but to, to make this argument stick, you're going to have to say that the brain is a super busy uh, computational uh, machine. And it really does raise the question of, is this really what's going on in the brain? Uh, so uh, even people who, who are enthusiasts about this approach have their doubts. And there are uh, a lot of people who are uh, very skeptical about uh, this. So uh, a, an example of how um, this can misfire is the uh, history of um, um, uh, computer chess programs. And they were originally designed by what people thought chess masters did. And it was something that was very computational demanding, computationally demanding. It involved figuring out for each possible step what the possible consequences would be out to X number of steps. Uh, and the computer worked better the more it had uh, in the uh, way of, uh, of um, computational power to, to go out to more and more steps and so on and so forth. And then, then it, the question was, well, this is how grandmasters think. And so grandmasters sit there and play 30 games at a time. They do it instantly. Uh, they um, uh, don't seem to do 
a lot of uh, computation when they do it. Um, so how do they do it? Um, so uh, Herbert Simon, who is my, my hero in a lot of ways, but uh, the source also of the, the, the standard approach in a lot of ways, uh, had uh, worked a lot on pattern recognition, especially in the in the 70s, and when I was a young assistant professor, I wrote him about something, and he sent me this huge packet of articles on uh, pattern recognition. And what he, he was interested in was how he, could you uh, have AI do scientific discovery? So his problem was, well, you couldn't, it didn't really work with induction, uh, that, but it might work if, you, if uh, it was pattern recognition. Um, so he applied this stuff to uh, chess as well, and the argument that uh, he came up wa uh, with was that, well, what chess players do is they recognize patterns and they organize the patterns that they're able to recognize in bigger clumps, which allows them to uh, sort of instantly see what the consequences are of a particular uh, uh, chess move. Um, and they've got just bunches of these to uh, um, rely on when they're going around uh, playing 30 games at a time. So what this suggests is you can get very similar outcomes playing chess with radically different underlying processes. So that's a problem for uh, people trying to model these processes. It looks like it's one thing. You can mimic it in some way, but really it might be something quite different that's producing that. And in the case of chess, it's sort of interesting, and also the case of uh, Go, which has been a hot topic recently. The machines actually think up things that the people don't think up. So there is definitely a difference in uh, cognitive processes. It's not just a matter of computational uh, power. OK. so. Uh, the standard approach is, this is um, uh, the standard approach, basically. It's, uh, when I was a kid, there was a show, uh, uh, I think it was a Disney cartoon that made a huge impression on me. And it, it was a perfect uh, embodiment of this model. It was the brain. And the brain included all of these little messengers that were running around. And there was a guy who looked like George Jetson sitting in a kind of uh, top position. And he'd receive the messages. And then he'd send out a messenger. So he'd receive a perceptual message. Then he'd send out the messenger to move the leg, and so on and so forth. And uh, um, you know, it's a great vivid <laughs> picture of the brain. And it fits with a lot of ways that the brain gets described, like in terms of executive function, and so on and so forth. And I realized much later that, well, this is actually the model of, of, of a corporation. So that what, what, the, what they've actually done is, is taken a, a, a modern corporation and imposed it on the brain and said, OK, this is the way it works, because this is the way it has to work in order for, to get anything done. OK, so you get uh, um, uh, at least a picture of how you get these kinds of uh, uh, results. OK, so the crit criticism of this is it's just too much computation. Uh, it requires what the critics call mental gymnastics, um, and uh, that it can't possibly be the case that there's that much computation going on in, the, in these uh, uh, examples. So one of the big, big uh, Galistel's uh, big examples is ant uh, navigation. So ants do pretty good, uh, a good job of uh, finding their way home, carrying a big piece of food or whatever. They bounce around a little bit, but they, they get there. And you can model this in terms of uh, modules, all of the different things that the ant needs to do in order to navigate their way uh, home. And since ants don't really have very big brains, and we don't usually think of them as that clever, um, it has to be done in some other way. And the idea is that it's done by modules. And modules are sort of not very smart uh, um, units that have one task to do and therefore can do it very quickly. And if you line up a bunch of these, you can perform uh, 
these combinatorial tasks uh, very quickly. And there's a sort of um, uh, technique of describing this uh, boxology. I'll give you some examples uh, later. Okay, so what's assumed in uh, this whole approach is that, uh, th that what goes on in the brain is pretty much like the stuff that's explicit. So this is where we get the you know, problem of tacitness. So the idea uh, consistently in um, this literature is that um, something that we talk about explicitly is actually going on tacitly in the brain. So we could talk about how we make a decision, we argue about what car to get, and we say, well, I like this one because it's, uh, the color's nice and it's good on gas, and so on. And so then the idea is that, well, anytime somebody does something, we can model that also as a decision. And uh, we can do that all the way down to ants and even microbes and uh, ascribe decision making to those, uh, those brains. Um, so the idea there is that, yeah, uh, what happens in what I've been calling the Verstehen bubble is pretty much uh, carried out silently uh, in the brain. So other people say, no, that's completely screwy. Uh, and uh, uh, whatever happens underneath the explicit doesn't really look at all, a lot like the explicit. So Jerry Fodor is sort of the um, um, champion of uh, uh, this view. And in this case, he's talking about um, the mind and models of mind. And he's, asked, he's concerned about the question of, okay, this belief, desire, model of action that we use to understand the world, uh, is that really there, is that really true, and does it actually operate in the brain? And his answer is, we would be really out of luck if that wasn't true. It's, it is an approximation of what really happens in the brain, and it happens also to accord with our common sense language. And you can see why this would get into trouble with diversity because there are lots of languages that don't actually use the word belief at all. Uh, so <laughs> the model uh, is very much a, uh, a specific Western model. Um, so Dan Dennett also says this. This is a recent uh, letter in TLS. And he, he says, yeah, it's, it's, it's true that cognitive science uh, relies on as ascribing to these uh, um, subsystems uh, the language of ordinary uh, psychology, our ordinary psychology, and we, uh, or folk psychology, and we um, ascribe it to these little modules that are doing the work of making uh, combinations of various kinds, and that's okay. There's nothing problematic about that. Okay, so you get things like, like this. So this is just a straight uh, piece of uh, computer science boxology. Um, you're trying to understand a process. You uh, draw it in this way. You see what, uh, what um, calls go from one thing to another in order to produce the output. Um, it's modular and so on. So this was just taken over as a way of thinking about the mind. And so here's uh, a, an attempt to say what um, goes into uh, behavior. And this is a super simple version of it. But you can see the things in the, in the boxes are things that more or less correspond to things that are already there in folk psychology. What you see is perceptual or hear or whatever is perceptual processes and so on and so forth. So we're ascribing all this folk, folk psychological stuff to stuff in the brain. And it seems like we have to do that because uh, the um, brain has to do something uh, combinatorial. Um, and it's, so it's got to have units to process and it's got to combine those units and then turn them into uh, outputs. And uh, from the point of view of Fodor and lots of other people, you can't even start learning unless you've got rules. And 
Uh, so all of this, a lot of this stuff needs to be innate and it has to be, it just gets activated by uh, experiences. So this stuff like your theory of mind, it's already there. It just gets activated at a certain age. It's not something you actually learn. It's something that you, and it's something you probably couldn't learn. You couldn't learn it inductively. It's kind of like a theory because it gets better, but you wouldn't just hit on this theory out of uh, complete uh, ignorance. Okay, so if we give that answer to this, then uh, we also have to say that, well, this stuff was evolved. Uh, how, did it, how does it get there and how is it there universally? Uh, doesn't seem to be another story about how it gets there other than to say that uh, it was evolved. And um, so this puts a lot of emphasis on all of the, the things that are the modules that are universal. They have to do a lot of the, all of the work basically. It doesn't allow for much variation because evolution produced the same stuff for everybody. And uh, so you get a kind of universal uh, mind. So uh, they, there's something odd about this. This is the way they're supposed to work. Uh, they're silent and uh, we're not aware of them. Uh, they're ceaseless and invisible in their operations. We can't introspect them. We can't talk about them. Uh, we can only uh, infer that they're, they're there, but they're the things that give us the world that we um, uh, live in. Okay, so the problem with this is um, we also seem to be able to operate ceaselessly and silently in this way with these inferences on things that aren't evolved. So on our uh, basic cultural uh, activities. So uh, example that Merleau-Ponty gives is uh, buying a gift for an eight-year-old, birthday present for an eight-year-old girl. How do you know what's an appropriate birthday present? Well, that's cultural knowledge. You know, if, if I'm in uh, Pango Pango and trying to figure out what to give, I don't know, I wouldn't know. Do a carved coconut? Uh, I just wouldn't have any idea what that would be. But we can instantly see, well, no, that uh, um, AR-15 is probably not a, an appropriate gift for a, an eight-year-old girl. We, and, and we don't have to think at all about that sort of thing. We uh, are pretty good at uh, uh, making these kinds of judgments without much uh, effort. So that looks like exactly the kind of, of uh, high-speed stuff that uh, should be universal, yet we've learned it somehow or other. Um, and a, a lot of what we do involves this kind of inaccessible uh, automat automatic pro uh, processing. So if I ask you, well, what, 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 what's the principle by which you shouldn't give a, a AR-15 to an eight-year-old girl, you could think up something, but you would just be thinking up something. It wouldn't be something that you would access the principles that are operating in your mind that govern this particular uh, distinction. So this isn't the evolved kind, it's some other kind. And that turns out to be pretty important for social life. Okay, so, uh, so here's the way things go. Uh, we take this ordinary folk language and ascribe stuff to these inaccessible thoughts that make them look like they're the same thing. And uh, it's culturally specific, which may be a problem. And maybe that doesn't matter because uh, there's a universal language of thought that is just tacit, and that's Fodor's solution to this. But as his followers even say, this would have to be incredibly massive to account for all of our uh, actual language, which makes it a little less uh, plausible. So is there an alternative to this uh, fancy picture? Um, it's very difficult to construct an alternative, and there are a lot of issues here. Uh, and there's a strong case to be made that computational psychology is central the key to all of this, these issues is how fast the brain does these tacit operations. Uh, 
Um, and every alternative is also computational. They're just different computational uh, models. Um, but it may be that a lot of what we do is something works, uh, cognitively works something like this, at least in, in the level that we're talking about. Um, maybe a, it's a lot like the chess case, that we do recognize lots of uh, patterns out there. And uh, we know that people are really good at recognizing patterns. In fact, they're really good at recognizing patterns even in random <laughs> stuff. They think they're patterns when there aren't patterns. So we're, we're pattern uh, producing, pattern recognizing uh, people. And we're also really good at looking at very limited data and figuring out what's going on. Um, so a lot of some of these early mirror neuron uh, related studies tried to figure out, okay, you're looking at somebody walk, how, what um, pieces of data do you need to recognize that? And so they taped reflective uh, things on people and put them in black suits and filmed them and showed this to people and they, could, they only needed three different data points in order to fill in all of this stuff. So that's true for motion, but it's also true for things like social situations and so forth. We see bits of it, uh, we, we fill it in. Um, and it, this, does, this kind of process might do a lot of work of the, the uh, things that philosophers worry about, like conceptual content. Um, so uh, there are possible alternatives to this uh, encodingist uh, story. So what's in common with these alternative approaches that I su suggested before is they, they uh, cut down on the mental gymnastics. So if the big problem is to explain speed of processing, this is what they're good at. Um, but the price is uh, that um, they um, in it completely inadvertently, because this is not what they were constructed to do, uh, create a lot of social variation. So all of the stuff that goes into these things, like the kinds of actions you do, even bodies, and uh, um, certainly the extended parts of mind are different for different people. They're more similar for people in the same kind of social setting, and, uh, but they're individualized all the way down. Okay. Um, so that's a huge uh, um, uh, change. And I'll sort of quit here because this is where the social theory stuff uh, uh, ends. Um, all of those things are socially distributed. They're different all over the world in all kinds of different groups. And if, if those are important in constituting the mind, then the mind is pervasively affected by facts about social distribution. It's different for different people because they're in different settings, because they, they relate to the world, the world they relate to is different, and it's constituting their mind. So that's pervasively social. That's different from the one that we saw way earlier, which you might call Hobbesian social. That's where you get fully developed people negotiating to create social forms. That's fine. That may happen to some extent, but the social influences on what goes into mind according, if you take these 4E approaches, are going to be more, are going to be really pervasive. So, uh, yeah, so we all live, and, and we can think of this computationally as uh, um, we all live in different worlds because we all solve our computational problems in different ways. And what the world is to us, in a sense, is uh, what's computationally accessible to us. And what's different for us is what's differently computationally accessible to us. And uh, so in a sense, we all live in our own little, little uh, uh, computational cocoons that depend on our computational load and how much we've shoved into the category of the tacit, and that's going to vary uh, socially. So I've really talked a long time. I'm ready to talk, uh, talk about questions or whatever. So, yeah. Okay, um, fascinating and um, 
raises, I think, a lot of uh, issues. Ready to pass a mic to anybody who wants to raise a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, I would like to know what, in your view, would you consider intuition to play in um, understanding social relationships as we do with formal mathematical and logical relationships? Yeah. Yeah, there's a, a recently published book by uh, Mercier and Sperber that, that talks about uh, intuition. And I, I'm not sure I'm convinced about this line, but I think it, there's something to it, that um, there are um, intuition has a relationship to these underlying cognitive processes. And uh, it's a, not a direct relationship, but our intuitions are you know, produced by these underlying processes, and then uh, we then struggle to articulate them, and so on and so forth. Um, See, so just I, I, you know, there's no picture I've got, or they that they have either of how that actually happens in the brain, but it does. You know, th there's certain plausibility to it. So, especially if if uh, um, you know, it's a sort of mirror neuron case, and I'm uh, you know, uh, looking at somebody doing something and I realize what they're doing, there are two stages there. There's something, some fundamental stuff going on in the brain and then it comes to consciousness. So if it's not inhibited or whatever, it comes to consciousness in some form, that sounds like an intuition. Thanks for an interesting talk. Um, I just want to see if I'm understanding you, and maybe uh, maybe this is sort of a, a resolution of sort of the standard view versus the 4E view. Mm -hmm. So here's an analogy. So I have a, an iPhone in my pocket, I think probably many of us mm -hmm. do, and it's a computer. It right. is a traditional computer. It does a million different things. I could use it as a recording studio. I could use it as a community. I, I can talk on the phone with it. Right? Can, <laughs> Even that, yeah. But there's a million things that it will do depending on what I do to it, that is mm -hmm. what its environment is. Right. So you, maybe you could say that you know, the standard view is right, right? Our brains are these computers mm -hmm. made of meat, but what they actually end up doing, how we behave, how we think, et cetera, just varies according to our environment as uh, happens with any yeah. other computer. So maybe there really isn't any discrepancy at all between the standard view and this 4E view. It's just how, com how regular computers work as well. Yeah, yeah. so I think the issue is, is where the, the uh, mental gymnastics are, are going on. How much you want to load into the brain and how much you want to uh, say gets offloaded to other things. And uh, you know, you, uh, you can think of you know human cultural evolution as this huge process of just offloading more and more stuff, uh, all the stuff that the hunter gatherer has to do to survive and gets this meager existence. Uh, we don't have to do, and because we've offloaded it onto objects and things like that, and um, so we might still have a lot of cognitive capacity, but we get a lot more bang for the buck because we've offloaded so much of the cognitive work to other things. Yeah. My question is, well, it seems at some level, a, a couple of questions, but I guess the first one is, when you talk about typification and uh, seeing patterns mm -hmm. and so forth, that obviously is a kind of core cognitive process. Yeah. So uh, there's a way in which the, the 4E approach itself, in a way, I think I'm mirror neuroning <laughs> uh, Steve's point. You know, there's a way in which the, the 4E approach depends upon the um, existence of these core, of some core processes. Right. Well, usually they try to, to you know, one of the big kinds of arguments is that uh, they're not, they can provide alternative uh, processes that aren't as computationally demanding. So the standard example is this diving gannet. So the, the gannet is a bird, it, it's one of those that um, 
you know, dives for its fish, it somehow manages to never smash into the water. So if you're doing this computationally, you've got to do a lot of computation in order to have that happen. So that what they suggest is, no, uh, it's just done more simply. It might be the decreasing visual field or some much simpler uh, mechanism. And those aren't really totally incompatible with um, the sort of heavy computational approach, but um, they make uh, uh, a big point of um, uh, arguing that um, these things don't have to be constructed. It's have to argument. They don't have to be constructed in this way. I guess I have a fundamental question about the uh, cognitive science enterprise and uh, the computer metaphor that it seems to be almost entirely based on. So, um, you know, as humans, and we, we, we created these remarkable tools that we call computers, and it seems we've become very enamored with right. their power. They do amazing things for us. And somehow, socially in the process, we've become so enamored with them that we've um, assumed, or we somehow assumed that it, the component processes, the modules, the processors, everything we put in, are somehow uh, an, an inherent part of the universe, or at least yeah. biology on the planet. And I just wonder to what extent um, the you know the orientation of our thinking in that regard really prevents us from thinking about things in a you know more based in chemistry biochemistry mm -hmm. biology where there's all sorts of quote computation right. that occurs obviously it does but the the principles on which that happens are so vastly different from binary logic. Right. And what that enables, that have we constrained ourselves uh, in terms of making progress on understanding cognitive science writ large, not just yeah. for humans, but as applicable, uh, you know, across many species, by clinging to these computer metaphors? Yeah, you're asking the sixty-four thousand dollar question. I think the the issue is that. This is such a powerful metaphor, and it seems to do such great things, that even though you get all these different alternatives that are all partial alternatives, they don't really add up to something that is equivalent to and as persuasive as the original metaphor. So it, you can be persuaded by all of those arguments, but they don't fit together perfectly either, and they don't... Uh, um, yeah, so they, they have the problem of uh, getting into some sort of coherent unit, and they, it's, it's even a feature of the argumentation that they tend to want to go at the strongest uh, uh, element of the, art, the views that they're contesting, so they tend to stick not to the social stuff, not at all, because that's too mushy. They tend to stick to very precise things like ant navigation or diving gannets or things like that. So they don't like to talk too much about the larger implications of this because they want to contest the main findings. Other questions? Okay, well, thanks very much, Stephen, and final appreciation. Well, thank you very much.